the more inequality there is in a society, the less healthy that society is, the more disease there is in that society. So what this individualism is getting us is more illness, more alienation, and more conflict. Individuality, that's something else. So the people have the need to be authentically individual. They also have a need to belong. And there's no contradiction between the two. But there is a contradiction between our need to belong and what we call individualism. Mind and body cannot be separated. And if mind and body cannot be separated, it also means that the individual cannot be separated from the environment. So there's been brilliant doctors who've known this all along. Rudolf Virchow in Germany, actually Virchow, a German physician <clears throat> in the mid uh, 19th century was sent to Silesia, Silesia, where there was a typhus epidemic. He was a German physician from Berlin. These were mostly Polish workers in, in at that time in a part of Germany that was populated mostly by a Polish speaking population. And he pointed out that you cannot separate the infections of these people from their education level, from their poverty. He recommended that they be allowed to teach their kids Polish, that, 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 that there be communal health and so on. And he said, you can't separate politics from health. And that politics is only the continuation of medicine on a larger basis. We evolved as communal creatures. We evolved for millions of years and hundreds of thousands of years and tens of thousands of years until very recently as people living in family communities, people supporting each other, moving together, living together, hunting together, um, getting food together, raising children together. That's how we evolved. Even our own species, Homo sapiens, we have been around for 150, 200,000 years until about 15,000 years ago, all of us lived like that. Now most people, a lot of people are isolated, alienated. In this culture, the capitalist culture tells us that human nature is selfish and greedy and aggressive and um, individualistic. That's not how we evolved. Had we been like that, we never could have evolved. <laughs> Hello everybody, my name is Grzegorz Jankowicz and this is another episode of the series of conversations called The Nature of the Future with writers, philosophers, scientists and psychologists. I talk about how what has happened in the past or what is happening now will affect uh, our lives in the future. Today my guest is uh, Gabor Mate. He is a physician who has spent decades helping patients who suffer from uh, addiction, uh, trauma and ADD. Uh, some of his books have been translated and published in Poland, uh, including uh, Scattered Minds, The Origins and Healing of Attention Deficit Disorder, uh, When the Body Says No, The Cost of uh, Hidden Stress and uh, in the realm of hungry ghosts, close encounters with addiction. In this conversation, we will focus on the last book by uh, Gaber titled The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness and Healing in a Toxic Culture. Uh, and this is why the conversation is titled On Toxic Culture. Hello, Gaber. Hello, nice to meet you. Uh, it's very nice that you accepted the uh, invitation. Um, for people who know your previous books uh, and listen to your lectures, uh, the main argument of the myth of normal will not be surprising. Our health depends on how we live. You have been repeating for years that disease is not something random or mysterious, uh, but it is the result of a process influenced by internal and external factors. However, it seems that this approach is still unpopular in medicine. Physicians usually ask uh, the patient for symptoms. They jump into diagnosis and prescribe uh, the, the pill. Uh, why is that? 
Well, the separation of mind from, from the body has been endemic in Western culture for a long time. I was just in Greece uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, 2,500 years ago, Socrates said about the doctors of Greece that the problem with the doctors of today, he said, is that they separate the mind from the body. 2,500 years ago. So this um, mind-body separation is is uh, ingrained in Western thought. It's become much more pronounced since the Industrial Revolution and Descartes. You know, I think, therefore I am. The mind is separated from the body. But it's been endemic for a long time. Now, this is contradiction to um, Eastern medicine and indigenous medicinal practices around the world where they always saw the mind and the body as one unit. It's not so strange that Western medicine ignores indigenous or Eastern medicine. Well, it is strange, but it's maybe understandable as a cultural bias. What is much more difficult to understand is that Western medicine also ignores all the Western science that has shown the unity of mind and body. So that uh, in actual life, people's emotions affect their physiology and vice versa. Mind and body cannot be separated. And if mind and body cannot be separated, it also means that the individual cannot be separated from the environment. So there's been brilliant doctors who've known this all along. Rudolf Virchow in Germany, actually Virchow, a German physician <clears throat> in the mid uh, 19th century was sent to Silesia, Silesia, where there was a typhus epidemic. He was a German physician from Berlin. These were mostly Polish workers in, in at that time in a part of Germany that was populated mostly by a Polish speaking population. And he pointed out that you cannot separate the infections of these people from their education level, from their poverty. He recommended that they be allowed to teach their kids Polish, that, 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 that there be communal health and so on. And he said, you can't separate politics from health. And that politics is only the continuation of medicine on a larger basis. Virchow said this in the 19th century. In the 19th century, um, Physicians pointed out that multiple sclerosis is caused by stress, that rheumatoid arthritis, that breast cancer is related to stress. Big name physicians whose memory is still held in great honor in the medical history books, whose teachings have been totally forgotten. So what I'm saying is that this mind-body separation, um, despite, and, and now since Virchow's days and since the days of these other physicians that I mentioned, there's been hundred years of research showing physiologically how mind and body can't be separated, but the average doctor never gets that information. It's very strange. So doctors have this view that it's all biological and they don't understand that the biology is affected by the psychology and vice versa. And that means if the psychology affects the biology, psychology doesn't develop in isolation it happens in relationship in a culture that means that the culture affects the biology it's a very simple scientific argument not even controversial from the point of view of the research but the average doctor never hears it i talked with my son a 16 year old son before uh, this interview uh, i presented to him your argument that our health depends on how we live. To which yeah. he said that often uh, our health depends on how we can live, how we are able to lead our life, how we are allowed to live. Uh, I was really surprised by this, uh, this observation. He pointed out immediately the systemic machinery uh, determining our existence and health. And uh, I found this remark as very insightful and it coincides with your argument, right? Well, absolutely. Uh, your son has got good, um, good insights. Um, the, it, it, let's, take, let's take 
a Canadian example, a very obvious one, a very tragic one, okay? So in Canada, and I don't know how much is known about Canadian history in Poland, but we have an indigenous population, the so-called Canadian Indians, but they're not Indians, they're not from India, they're indigenous to Canada. These people did not used to have <clears throat> autoimmune disease at all before colonization, very little or none. Now today, an indigenous woman has six times the risk of rheumatoid arthritis than non-indigenous people, six times the risk. And if you look at the literature on rheumatoid arthritis, linking it to trauma and stress, you can see that there's a deep connection. This is true in the United States as well. So people of color, people who are um, of lower class origin, they have higher risk of autoimmune disease. This has been known for decades. This means that how we live, our society forces you to live, the way it discriminates against you or makes you more privileged, um, it all has a huge impact on your health. Uh, you point out that the uh, root of the problem uh, is this toxicity of our culture. How do you define this toxic element or this toxic force? And what kind of culture are we talking about? Because, you know, of course, in a globalized world, certain cultural mechanisms operate everywhere. But are yeah. we really able to formulate such a universal definition of toxic contemporary culture? Well, um, let's begin with a simple understanding of culture. Now, if you're a laboratory scientist, and if you're growing bacteria in a dish, you'd call that a culture. I don't know what the Polish word might be, but in English you say that you're culturing these organisms. Exactly if the same in that, Polish. Okay. If in that dish, Petri dish, the organisms are getting sick or dying in large numbers, you'd say there's a toxic culture. Now, in the globalized world, you have autoimmune disease happening in societies that never used to have them. You have kids being diagnosed with ADHD, attention deficit hyperactive disorder, that never used to appear in those countries. So there's something about the globalized capitalist culture that is actually toxic. Now, what is that? In order to understand what was happening in the laboratory, you'd have to look at what are the needs of these organisms and how does the culture that we're growing them in not meet their needs? So now we have to look at what are human needs. And the real question is, to what does degree does a culture, any culture, meet the actual needs of human beings? So, people have certain physical needs, for nutrition and shelter and so on. On those grounds, modern society is pretty good to a lot of people, although, if you look at it more deeply, not so good because throughout the world, there's a spread of people eating sugar and junk foods and all kinds of terrible stuff that's really bad for them. That's just a phenomena um, that's happening throughout the capitalist world and big corporations make big money out of send, selling terrible food, non-nutrition, non-nutritious foods to a lot of people. But let's agree that for the most part, people are nourished and they're housed. But human beings don't only have physical needs, they also have emotional needs. And particularly children have emotional needs. So, um, what are the emotional needs of children? Well, one, unconditional loving acceptance just for who they are that's a need of the child the child can live without it but he won't be really healthy without it emotionally healthy the child has a need um, to be able to rest in the relationship with the adult which means that the child shouldn't have to work to make the relationship work the child shouldn't have to be nice or pretty or compliant. 
the child shouldn't have to take on the needs of the parents. In a lot of homes, for example, um, in my home country of Hungary, there's a lot of alcoholism. In those homes, the children end up taking emotional care of the parents. So there's no rest for the children. When parents are stressed, that stresses the children. If parents are stressed, you can look at the stress hormone levels of the children, they'll be abnormal. Studies have shown that the more stressed the parents are, the more likely the kids are to have asthma, for example. Lots of studies have shown that, by the way. So children have this need to be rest, uh, to be protected from the parents' stress. Children have a need to have all their emotions experienced and validated and accepted. A lot of the way that in modern society, parents are told to raise parents forces kids to suppress their emotions. Children have a need for free, spontaneous play out in nature. Kids don't have that anymore. At least here in North America, they barely have it. What they have is they have these things to play with. That's not free, spontaneous play out in nature. Now, a society that doesn't meet those needs of the children is a toxic society. Those children are not going to grow up in a healthy way. I could go on. Adults have needs. Adults have not just a need to, to eat and to have a bed to sleep in. They also have a need for meaning, purpose in their lives. They have a need for a sense of connection and belonging to a genuine community. They have a need for mastery. They have a need for a sense of control over their lives. When you deprive people of these needs, you're creating pathology that's toxic. And furthermore, when we, uh, this is the last thing I'll say to this question, we evolved as communal creatures. We evolved for millions of years and hundreds of thousands of years and tens of thousands of years until very recently as people living in family communities, people supporting each other, moving together, living together, hunting together, um, getting food together, raising children together. That's how we evolved. Even our own species, Homo sapiens, we have been around for 150, 200,000 years until about 15,000 years ago, all of us lived like that. Now most people, a lot of people are isolated, alienated. In this culture, the capitalist culture tells us that human nature is selfish and greedy and aggressive and um, individualistic. That's not how we evolved. Had we been like that, we never could have evolved. You wouldn't have survived in nature if you were like that. So what I'm saying is that whether it comes to the needs of children or to the needs of adults, this society undermines them. And that's, that's what the toxicity is. You write that um, because of all of this, all of you said, um, uh, that our concept of well-being must move from the individual uh, to the global in every sense of that word. However, yeah. this individual perspective, the myth of individualism and self-made man is still very strong. Uh, I remember what you said, what you wrote um, about addiction, that to understand what addiction is, we should start by analyzing its positive aspects. Shouldn't we do the yeah. same with the myth of individualism? Shouldn't we try to answer the question, what have we gained from it? Or what have we covered with this myth of individualism? Well, first of all, we have to make a distinction between individuality and individualism. They're not the same thing. Individuality is very important for everybody. We have to know who we are. We have to be connected to ourselves. We have to know our our two intentions, our two purposes. We have to find meaning in our lives. And we can't just be um, submerged in a group and lose our, our, our personhood. That's individuality. Individualism is me against everybody else. 
individualism is I don't care about the group. It's just all about me. Where has that got us? There was an article in Time magazine, um, which is not exactly a left-wing publication. There was a, a, a three years ago that pointed out that in the last several decades, the top 1% has gained $50 trillion at the expense of everybody else. That's where individualism has got us. And we know when you look at societies, the, from the health point of view, this has been studied by scientists, you know, I can name them, you know, um, that the more inequality there is in a society, the less healthy that society is, the more disease there is in that society. So where this individualism is getting us is more illness, more alienation, and more conflict. Individuality, that's something else. So that people have the need to be authentically individual, they also have a need to belong. And there's no contradiction between the two. But there is a contradiction between our need to belong and what we call individualism. I want to ask you uh, to interpret with me uh, one scene from a literary text. Uh, hmm. There is a scene in Dickens' last completed novel uh, titled Our Mutual Friend. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the characters, uh, Ryder Hood, uh, irritates everyone. People just hate him. Uh, hmm. He searches the river in a boat to find drowned people uh, whom he robs and then uh, delivers their corpses to the police station uh, to earn uh, a few more pennies. One day, uh, Ryder Hood's boat is rammed by a ship. Uh, he himself, uh, unconscious, is pulled ashore, and those who hate him immediately begin to help him. But as soon mm. as he regains consciousness, uh, as soon as he comes back to his body, so to say, they abandon yeah. him. They just leave. Huh. It seems to me that Dickens captured something extremely important in this scene. And, and I feel like it has a lot to do with your story about toxic uh, culture. Uh, don't you agree? Well, <laughs> it's interesting you should mention that book because that's the one book of Dickens I haven't read yet. It's on my shelf. It's on, it's on my list. I just finished reading Bleak House last year and I, I read about one Dickens every year or two. So um, what do I get from that story? I'm not sure I understand your reference, but let me think about it. Um, their compassion for him is the human compassion for a human being that's suffering, which is natural to human beings. Their rejection of him is their revulsion at his personality. So, th th which is selfish and ghoulish, you know? And um, I think what's being shown here is, on the one hand, we all have this common humanity, and on the other hand, there's our personalities that get in the way. But my point is that the personality is not who we are. Like that character, I haven't read the book, and I don't know if Dickens goes into it, but who becomes like that? Somebody becomes like that selfish and that mm, greedy and that ghoulish only because they suffered in childhood. And that's how they learn to survive. So I don't know what meaning you take from that episode, but that's what I that's how I understand it. That's a magnificent interpretation. Uh, I, I felt yeah. that you will just immediately catch the, the point that I saw in this, in this fragment. Uh, thank you. Mm. Um, uh, let me stay with writers uh, for a moment. Uh, in the preface, you, you cite a passage from uh, David Foster Wallace's speech, a beautiful yeah. anecdote yeah. about two young fish, the older fish, uh, ask them, what's up? Uh, how is, uh, how's the water? As the two fish swim away, one asks the other, 
what the hell is water? And you uh, yeah. write that what we treat as obvious uh, becomes uh, transparent and we simply cannot see the problem in it and behind it. We cannot see the problem with it. Uh, what is normal and therefore obvious to us can be destructive. Uh, I feel like normalcy is your enemy in this book. Well, our understanding of normalcy. Uh, now, <clears throat> as a medical doctor, I was trained to understand that certain certain conditions are normal. And normal meaning healthy and natural. So um, there's a normal range of blood pressure. If you're below that, you might die. If you're above it, you might die. Normal range of temperature within which you can live, outside of which life is threatened. Normal range of blood acidity. So in other words, what is normal equals healthy and natural. In physiological terms. But we make the same assumption in social terms. That whatever we're used to, we think it's normal. But what is normal in a toxic culture, what we're used to, is neither healthy or natural. For example, um, <clears throat> it's very normal for people to eat junk food in the sense that a lot of people do it and advertisements and, as I said earlier, big companies make a lot of money out of conspiring to figure out what combination of sugar and fat and salt will pe make people most addicted and they create products. So it's very normal for people to eat junk food in this society because in the sense that it's what we're used to. We're so used to it, we don't even see it for what it is. But is it healthy or natural? No, it isn't. Or if um, there was an American neurologist, Oliver Sacks, who used to be an, a writer as well, and he I, I think he wrote a book called Anthropologist from Mars. So let's assume that an anthropologist appears on Earth from Mars. What do you think that it's normal that the top 300 people in the world or the top 100 own as much as the bottom half of humanity? Of humanity? What do you think that's normal? Or, or would, he, would he actually ask himself, what kind of society would create that degree of power imbalance and inequality? But we take it, we think it's normal. We don't you know, we even, barely even talk about it. So, not that normal is my enemy, it's our conception of normal is I think that's so damaging. And it's, you know, there's a famous, um, analogy that people use if you take a cold-blooded animal like a frog and you put him in cold water and you or you put him in hot water all of a sudden he'll jump right out but if you put him in cold water and you gently and slowly and gradually incrementally raise the temperature of the water he'll boil to death because he gets so used to it he won't recognize it as as dangerous and we're like that so <clears throat> So, Gabor, how can we change anything about this toxic, this toxicity of culture if, as you said, and I totally agree with you, if capitalism protects its very foundation, uh, protects the, the whole system, how we can rage, we can have uh, um, all kinds of um, uh, ideas uh, to change our situation, social, political, uh, emotional and physical, but how can we... Uh, subvert the very system that actually protects the uh, structure in which we live. Well, I think if you look at um, Eastern European history, um, and I grew up in Hungary, I was 13 when we left after the Hungarian Revolution in 1956. And uh, incidentally, the Hungarian Revolution was um, sparked by demonstrations in support of Polish people uh, because there were demonstrations in Poland in the fall of 1956 as well. And when you look at the fall of communism, what happened was that 
it's not that somebody said, let's put an end to this, is that there's a whole movement arose where people just started openly talking about the truth, recognizing the way things were and not being satisfied with it anymore. And uh, there was a very famous joke in Eastern Europe, I'm sure it was repeated in Poland as well, about the difference between capitalism and socialism, you know, that under capitalism, what is capitalism? Under capitalism, man exploits man. And under social, under communism, it's the other way around, you know, <laughs> under capitalism. And, 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 and that's actually true. And, and, and when I came to North America, it, it didn't take me long to realize is that everything the Soviets had said about the Americans was true. Imperialist, controlling the world, exploiting people, racism, all that. And everything that the Americans said about the Soviets is also true. Imperialist, exploitative, brutal, dictatorial, it's all true. Everything they said about each other was true. And everything they said about themselves was a lie on both sides. That's what I saw. So I don't have any big formulas for people. I'm just saying, if you want to change the system, talk, tell the truth about it and talk about the truth, you know, and, and I think people have the capacity um, history has shown this over and over again. No system lasts forever. Any system that's going to last, thinks it's going to last forever, is in for a very rude surprise. History moves. Individually, we can't move the wheel of history. But I think we can all make a contribution just by looking at the way things are and talking about the way things are and telling the truth about it. I think something emerges out of people when they look at the truth. So I don't have formulas for people. And I write this book, not because I have a, um, a, a remedy or a, or a prescription, but because to talk about the truth and look at the way things actually are is essential for change and for healing. And that's true on the individual level. And so I promote healing on the individual level, but I also think it's true on a social level. And uh, in the last chapter, I quote the great black American writer, James Baldwin, and he said something, two things that I think are universally true. He was writing about the United States, but I think it's true of every country in the world. He said, number one, not everything that's faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed unless it's faced. That's the first thing he said. And the second thing he said was that words in this country, meaning the US, Words in this country are used more to cover the sleeper than to wake him up. And I think that's true in every country in the world. And especially the job of writers, I think, and poets and artists is to speak and to describe the truth the way it is. Not to put people to sleep, but to wake them up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you write one of the topics, uh, covered by this book is trauma. Mm, you write that our wounds uh, dictates much of our behavior. Um, they shape our social habits. Uh, they inform uh, our ways of uh, thinking about ourselves, about other people, about the world. Trauma yeah. affects us to an enormous degree. How can we cope with this uh, tyranny of the past, as one of the uh, doctors, physicians, uh, you quote, yeah. named trauma. Yeah. Yeah. So trauma is a wound. Trauma literally means wound. That's the Greek meaning of the word wound. And uh, these wounds hurt a lot. And, and um, when they happen in childhood, and then we try and protect ourselves from the, from the pain. So, for example, maybe, well, I, I can give you my personal example. So, you know, in the book, I talk about my own infancy as a, as a Jewish infant under the Nazi occupation in Budapest, 1944 to January 1945. And um, 
under those conditions, um, my mother was very stressed. She could barely ensure my survival. I was a very stressed infant. And I absorbed her pain and her and her grief. So all my life I've created a lot of emotional pain and grief. Not, I can't even, not that I can recall what happened because there's no memory, there's no conscious memory. And then as you know, as I talk about in the first chapter of the book, to save my life when I was 11 months old, she gave me to a stranger in the street. Well, uh, and incidentally enough, uh, I was in Budapest just a couple of months ago, standing in the very street outside the very house on the very pavement where my mother gave me to the stranger. The house is still there. The pavement is still there. Well, as an infant, what do I conclude from that? What can I believe? That I'm not lovable, that I'm not wanted, that I'm not worthy. Otherwise, why is she giving me away? I don't know that she's doing this to save my life. All I know is, all of a sudden, I'm giving to a stranger. The meaning I make from it, and this is the wound. The wound is not what happens to us. The wound is not that she gave me to a stranger. That's not the wound. That's the traumatic event that caused the wound. The wound is my belief that I'm not lovable and worthy. That's the wound. What's the impact of that? It affects my whole personality. And as one specific example, it means that I become a doctor and I keep trying to prove to the world how important I am. And how do I do that? By never saying no, by always taking on new patients, doesn't matter how busy I was, by always being available day or night. Why? Because I'm still trying to prove that I'm worthwhile. In other words, I'm living under the tyranny of the past. And until I figure out and learn that actually my value as a human being has nothing to do with what I do for other people and what I give all the time. I just am valuable because I exist as every human being exists. Until I figure that out and learn that, I'm living under the tyranny of the past. So that's why it's important to figure it out. That's why it's important to, to learn about our traumas and to, and, and to heal them. It's very moving. Um... In the context of trauma, uh, the question of uh, responsibility seems to be very important. Uh, yes. There is someone or something responsible for the trauma, something or someone that evoked trauma. Uh, but I want to ask you about different kind of responsibility. Can a traumatized person take responsibility for their life afterwards after the trauma affected them um, yeah. for their actions can we expect it from from them it seems cruel yet relevant from the perspective of their uh, social interactions well if you look at the word responsibility break it down responsibility is the, is the capacity to respond. Now, if the traumatized person doesn't learn how to do that, nobody can do it for them. So to say that I was traumatized as an infant doesn't give me an excuse to um, behave in all kinds of ways. I'm still responsible for how I behave. But in order to take responsibility, I have to get to know myself. And uh, that's why the outside the oracle of Delphi, the, the oracle of uh, the shrine of the priestess of Apollo, uh, it said, know thyself, you know. So it, it's absolutely essential to, um, and, and that's why Socrates said, by the way, that the unexamined life is not worth living. So the self-examination and the understanding of trauma it's not so we can have an excuse to be irresponsible. It's actually a way to learn how to take responsibility. So it's not a question of excusing anything. Um, um, it's a question of 
if I want to know why I behave in a certain way, I have to look at, well, what happened to me? But that doesn't mean that I can just keep behaving in any old way I want. I'm, I'm the one who has to take responsibility for it. But in order to take responsibility, I have to be aware. There's no responsibility without awareness. Uh, I follow you on uh, social media and sometimes uh, I watch your streams. During one of such sessions, uh, you received a question uh, that I found very moving, uh, very interesting. Mm. The person asked whether they should forgive their parents who caused their trauma. And your yeah. answer was both surprising and uh, it was a, a sort of epiphany when you said it. You said that in your world, in your approach to the psyche, uh, to the life, there is no room for should or shouldn't. It just yeah. happens. What does yeah. it mean? Well, first of all, <clears throat> to say that the parents caused the trauma, they didn't cause it. The, if the it came through them, but they didn't cause it. Uh, if the parents hurt the child, which a lot of parents do, it's because they were hurt themselves. Um, in some countries in Eastern Europe, they still beat the children too often. That hurts the child. But the parents don't cause the hurt. The hurt came through the parent because the same thing happened to them, generation after generation after generation. So I don't put blame on people. That's my first point. So it's true. The trauma came through the parents. My trauma came to me, to my children, and I passed it on to them. And I talk about that very openly. Um, but I didn't cause it. Now, should they forgive me? This is where it comes into it. For in my world, there's no should or shouldn't. Um, forgiveness, I think, is something that happens when people are ready for it. So that when somebody heals and they're at peace, then forgiveness comes almost automatically. But I never tell anybody, you should forgive. If you have anger, explore the anger and respect it and understand where it came from. In fact, it's totally possible to be angry with somebody and forgive them at the same time. And when people are told to forgive, it's almost like they're told to let go of their anger before they're ready to. In my experience, that doesn't happen. In my experience, we let go of anger and we forgive when we're mature enough and ready for it. So it's not a prescription, it's a process. Uh, in the studies you, uh, you cited in the book, uh, trauma is uh, presented as pre-verbal, which means that it is impossible to reach the point where trauma is encoded in our brains and bodies with words. But as I mentioned to you before our conversation, I specialize in literature, I specialize in language, and I know writers mm. from the past and from now uh, who try to touch upon trauma, try to penetrate it and heal it. Uh, they try, try to do it all the time. Do you think that literature can help us in the healing process? Well, absolutely it can, <laughs> because great literature, um, it speaks to our deepest emotions and it speaks to our deepest possibilities and it can evoke our grief. Now, grieving is very important for healing. Great literature can also point to the beauty and the love that is an essential part of human beings. And that's very healing. Great literature also evokes people's desire for truth. And truth is very important for healing. So yeah, I think literature is a powerful agent for healing. Great literature is a powerful agent for healing. 
I just read, um, I reread, I think for the third or fourth time, Their Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. And um, that book is full of trauma. Full of trauma. One generation after another. Every one of those characters is a traumatized person. Um, but there's also so much healing in that book. Even though the characters, by the end of the book, you can't see them as healed, except maybe the youngest brother, Ayosha. But just because of the wisdom and the beauty and, and the depth of uh, Dostoevsky's understanding of human beings, it's such a healing book when you read it. Uh, Gabor, I'm intrigued by your definition of uh, addiction. Uh, you wrote about it, you, you spoke about addiction uh, in the past. You have a lot of experiences <laughs> from the field. You helped people, you took care of addicted people. Uh, this definition you, you put in this last book um, mm. is uh, very general, very universal. Uh, the most important thing about uh, addiction is not the external object, but the internal relationship to it. This definition can cover basically everything. We can be addicted. Uh, we have, we have, we can be heavy duty addicts to uh, drugs, but also to shopping, as you, uh, as you write in in the book. But doesn't such a broad formula make us, uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, such a broad formula make us unable to distinguish between addiction uh, and, for example, pleasure or, or passion? No. Um, here's the difference between passion and addiction. And I can give you my own example. Um, I'm passionate about classical music really passionate about it. Whether it's uh, Chopin or Penderecki or Liszt or Beethoven or Bartok or Shostakovich or, you know, anybody. Passionate about it. Which means I love it, it inspires me, it moves me, it speaks to my soul. But I used to be addicted to shopping for classical music, which has nothing to do with passion. It has to do with the desire to control and to gain and to um, temporarily make myself feel better. So the addiction was not to the music, but to the shopping for the music. I had to have every disc and I had to get the latest one. And when, once I got one batch, I had to go back to the store to get another batch, just like a drug addict. In fact, I used to work with drug addicts at that time. And I would tell my clients about it, that, you know, that I, and, and they said, doctor, you're just like the rest of us, aren't you? And uh, I was. I wasn't shooting drugs, but I was spending thousands of dollars a day and lying to my wife about it. Well, that's the addiction. The passion enlivens you and it enriches you. The addiction makes you poor, it robs you emotionally and in every other way, you know? So there's a difference between passion and, and addiction. And the, the, the difference is that the addiction controls you. The passion doesn't control you. The passion calls to you, but it doesn't drive you. The addiction drives you. The addiction is in charge. You're not. That's the difference. And the addiction and the passion doesn't leave you with negative consequences. The addiction does. I think that uh, your book about addiction should be read by book collectors, but I'm afraid that it may be the last book they will add to their collection, because <laughs> after reading it, they can realize that there is a huge problem. Um, they cover well, let, me let, me, let, let me interrupt let me interrupt and say mm -hmm. it depends why they're collecting books and how they're collecting it now if they're doing it because they really love books and they really consider it and it doesn't take away from the rest of their lives and it doesn't rob their family of money for food 
and it doesn't take up all their consciousness. It's just something that they love doing because they love the physicality of beautiful books or literature. That's wonderful. But if they're doing it compulsively, then they can't help it. And they have to get more and more and more and more and more because they feel so empty inside. So it's not a book collecting. It's, I said earlier, it, it's not the behavior. It's our internal relationship to it. Is it compulsive and does it cause harm? It's an addiction. Hmm. Is it a love and a passion but doesn't cause harm and it doesn't control you? Nothing wrong with it. You were assisted in writing this book uh, by your son, uh, Daniel. Uh, you write yeah. very warmly, beautifully about this uh, cooperation. I'm curious, uh, does it affect your father-son relationship, that kind of cooperation you had? Well, I should tell you the next book that we're writing. We're just starting to work on it now. And uh, this book will be 50-50. Um, uh, it's going to be entitled Hello Again, A Fresh Start for Parents and Their Adult Children. And uh, my son, who's 48 in September, um, him and I have had a lot of issues in our lives together. Uh, because when I was a young parent, I was emotionally very volatile and not always available and i was a workaholic and daniel suffered you know now writing the myth of normal together was a challenge and we had some really tense moments but at the same time it also fostered and you found mutual respect and a capacity to work together i, I could not have written this book without his help he was too big way too big for me by myself and he's just brilliant. And uh, he also is not afraid of me, so he's, he can see through my stuff and help me see when I'm being somewhat blind. And, you know, so he was very helpful. Uh, it was tough at times. We had some difficult, very tense moments. But on the whole, it became a very um, rewarding enterprise. Gabor, thank you uh, so much for for this interview, for for this in inspiring conversation, and for all the books you you wrote. Uh, we have to at least try to bring you to Krakow uh, in person uh, for another edition of uh, of Conrad Festival. I can promise you that I will do everything uh, to make it happen. I'd, I'd love to. Thank you. I'd look forward to that. And thank you for this interview. I really enjoyed being with you. Uh, dear all, uh, see you next month. Uh, be with us. Uh, be with the Conrad Festival. Gabor, thank you again. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Goodbye.